Uh, like a couple of lessons ago, a couple of lessons ago, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna start today's lesson with a video. Um, do I have to show you this video for you to understand the concepts that um, we're about to learn? Answer, no, but it's just so awesome that I can't not show you. So this is about a minute long. Um, I hope you enjoy. We slam into the atmosphere and develop so much aerodynamic drag. Our heat shield, it heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun. 1600 degrees. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about 1,000 miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. When it opens up that fast, it's a neck snapping 9Gs. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. So, like I said, I think it's pretty awesome. I remember the first time I saw this. This is for uh, NASA's Mars Curiosity rover, by the way. And if you want to see the rest of the video, you should absolutely go and Google after this lesson is finished. Um, seven minutes of terror, you will find that exact video. Um, to me, I remember watching that the first time and just being astonished, right? Science, which has sort of gotten us, uh, you know, all this incredible knowledge and has, you know, landed us on Mars. Um, it's a... Uh, a way of knowing things that's via experimentation. And I always kind of wondered, yeah, but how does that work when you're going somewhere, you've been trying something you've literally never done before because it is, you know, millions of kilometers away on another planet. Uh, how do you know that your parachute is going to work? That even though it is so light, it can withstand that amount of force, it's gonna slow you down to that kind of velocity. Um, and it's the mathematics of it, right? So today, we are going to be rounding out, can you believe it? Uh, mechanics with projectile motion. You've looked at projectile motion already in extension one, but we're gonna push further because the projectile motion you know about at the moment is imagining that there is no medium or that there is a medium that uh, exerts resistance that is negligible. So you can pretty much forget about it, right? Uh, and we've seen this before. You get this kind of very nice um, parabolic shape and the vast majority of you have encountered how to find that particular, what we call the equation of path, which is a parabola. Uh, lots of weird um, V's and G's and tan thetas and all that kind of thing. Uh, but what we're going to do is, we're in extension two, we're going to ratchet it up and we're going to work out what happens to projectile motion when you think about resistance. So you can see I've got this example that we're going to work through together this afternoon. Uh, and then there are some questions that we're going to work through which um, I just think are amazing that we can understand these complex physical systems using uh, essentially, you know, the differential and integral calculus that you've learned over the last two years. So let's have a go at this uh, together. A projectile is fired with velocity vector v equals, and then you've got uh, this particular format. We're using um, vector notation to indicate the horizontal and the vertical components. That's what you can see there, the i and the j, which are our unit vectors um, across and upward. Air resistance is proportional to the velocity and they give us, as a result, the equations of motion. So you can see here, here's the horizontal acceleration, uh, which is with proportion to the horizontal velocity, dx on dt. And then you've got the uh, vertical acceleration, which is, there's the gravity, which we've seen has to be taken into account in uh, vertical resisted motion. Uh, and then here you've got that same uh, constant of proportionality, which sometimes, by the way, worth noting down, I might jot it down just so you see it. It's often given in this context, a specific name. It's called the drag coefficient. Uh, for obvious names, it's a coefficient that describes how much aerodynamic drag there is. So shock horror, you can see why they called it that. So then if they give you these particular values for K, the drag coefficient, and if we're just gonna go with gravity being 10, uh, who needs 9.8 for this particular model? Here's the question. Maybe you wanna jot this down because uh, this, all of this working is not gonna, all the question is not gonna stay there as I scroll down. Find uh, the horizontal displacement as a function of time, 
find the vertical displacement as a function of time, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna smoosh them together and determine the Cartesian equation of motion, what I just called the equation of path, but it's gonna be something a little more complicated than the parabolas we looked at in extension one. So here's the um, roadmap we're going to have here. I'm going to walk you through finding the horizontal uh, equation for displacement and then I'm going to give you a nudge into finding the vertical equation for displacement and I'm going to let you finish off that work and then combine them together and, and then we're going to draw some conclusions from that once we arrive. Okay, so there's the roadmap uh, and let's begin by just taking this particular horizontal uh, differential equation that you can see here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write it um, in dot notation. Okay, so you can see here we're using uh, Leibniz's, you know, dx on dt and all that kind of thing. So because the left-hand side there is acceleration, in dot notation I would call that x double dot. And then on the right-hand side we've got minus or negative k x dot. There's dx on dt. There's my horizontal velocity. Now I just want you to stare at this with me for a moment. Some of you encountered this result before and so you're like, oh, I instantly know what to do here, but others of you will find this quite new. What we need to do is get from this to, mark this, right, uh, the horizontal displacement in terms of time. I need to introduce time into here somewhere. Uh, and it's a differential equation which doesn't have any, uh, any x's or t's in it yet. Um, I need to sort of get to there by integration, right? Now, there's a bunch of different ways to go about this, but the quickest way is to remember something that we learned all the way back in advance, uh, in one of the first differential equations that you encountered, even though you didn't necessarily get the language um, at the time. What you've got here is some function, right? It's multiplied by this constant, and that's going to be the same as that function's derivative, right? You can see this is the derivative with respect to t of this. Does this ring any bells? Do we know about a function that when you multiply it by a constant, you end up having the same thing, um, but the next level down after differentiation? Do you recognize this as modeling something that exists in real life? And it's not just air resistance. I wonder if it's ringing any bells for anyone. Does anyone want to post in the chat if they're brave enough? Um, it's a pair of words that some of you might recall from an application of calculus. Uh, Sham's got it, but go be brave, Sham. Put it, put it out there for everyone uh, so that they can see because that's what we should uh, pop on the side of this. Yeah, very good. So this is exponential decay, right? And just as a bit of a um, sort of flag for you, right? I want you to remember, uh, this looks a whole lot like we would write this a little differently um, in exponential decay. We might say there's a, uh, maybe I'll, I'll say a, an M rather than a P because P usually indicates um, population and we don't really want to think about populations that are exponentially decaying, um, especially under these circumstances. So if you've got like a mass, like a radioactive material, right? And it's changed with respect to time, if it's a decay situation, uh, it's gonna look something like this, right? Minus K M, uh, this is the differential equation that you get the rate of change is proportional to how much stuff there is. Um, the more radioactive material you have, the faster it is decaying and giving off that substance. So being that we can recognize this as an exponential, um, the solution to this differential equation is an exponential decay situation, what I can say is, I can sort of uh, infer from that that x dot which is kind of uh, corresponding to our M, if you like, um, our mass in the you know, exponential decay situation, that's going to be equal to some AE to the negative KT. This is the sort of stock standard exponential decay situation that you can get. And all I need to do here is find out what all of the constants are, well there's only two of them, A and K, by using the information provided to us in the question and that's going to enable us to find out uh, all the relative bits and pieces, okay? So, uh, for starters, what I can say is that the drag coefficient, the k, that we saw here uh, and which reappears here in the front of this, um, this second derivative, right? It's going to be this same k over here, so that's going to be a fifth, right? So I can actually just write, and this is going to be a e to the minus t on Five. So this is my uh, dx on dt, and I'm going to now try and find out what a is using my initial conditions. So I can say when t equals zero, what do I know about x dot? 
go back. Um, I, I didn't give you much time to write uh, in the question there. Go back to the top of the question. It tells you what the initial um, you know, velocity of projection is through that vector. It's in vector notation, right? So of those two, which one is the horizontal component? You can tell me in the chat, right? Go ahead, pop the number in for me. Very good, thank you Angad in first, but I'm sure several of you see it. So that I uh, unit vector is multiplied by 15, so that is going to be my initial condition when I'm just thinking about the horizontal motion. So from there, I can say, well, okay, once I substitute t equals zero into here, you can see e to the power of zero is just one. Uh, everything to the power of zero that we're dealing with is gonna be equal to one. Um, so therefore, I'm going to get um, a times one equals 15, because that's the x dot when time zero is uh, being evaluated. So therefore, I've got my coefficient there, a equals 15. So now I've got an equation for horizontal velocity, x dot equals 15 e to the negative t on five. I think we wrote up above, okay? Now, as promised, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this to get up to our, if you go back to the question, our displacement equation. I've got velocity with respect to time, so it's a straightforward, it's about as straightforward an integration as you can get. To integrate this up, I'm gonna say integrating, just so it's clear what I'm doing. And what I'm getting is just the displacement equation, and let's just write our integral out like so with respect to time. Now, of course, just like you've seen previously, we're gonna go ahead, do the integration, and then we're gonna get a constant which we'll need to evaluate. So let's go ahead and do all of that together. Um, be careful here, it's an exponential, right? So what you wanna do is divide through by the uh, inside derivative. And the inside derivative in this case was minus k, right? So therefore, I'm gonna get, when I divide through by that uh, negative a fifth, I'll get negative 75 e to the negative t on five, plus my constant. And so I'm ready to evaluate that if I know a certain displacement at a certain time. So I'm returning back to my initial conditions, not initial conditions for velocity, but initial conditions for displacement. And when you have a look up here, um, does it give you any information about where it's being fired from? And it looks to me like the answer is not particularly. Uh, so therefore we can make the um, position that's being fired from, we can make that the origin. Like why not choose easy numbers if you can? So I'm going to say uh, setting uh, original position as origin. If they don't define the origin for you, you'd better define it yourself as the origin, what that tells us is t equals zero implies x equals zero. And I hope it's not too arduous to see in much the same way that we saw this um, e to the negative zero on five became one. You're just gonna get negative 75 here. You're gonna get zero on that left-hand side. So all you get left with is that constant. So that's going to further imply that the constant is 75, right? So. Ta-da, we're kind of halfway there, or like at least a third the way there, because as you'll see, the next one is a bit more work. I've now got my horizontal displacement equation. So I'll pop the constant out the front since it's a, a subtraction that's attached to that exponential term, and I'm good to go. Hooray, I have x as a function of time.